Welcome to Ask the Tech Coach, brought to you by the TeacherCast Educational Network. If you are in charge of professional development and looking to build an innovative digital learning experience, this is the podcast for you. Join us each week as we uncover strategies that tech coaches are using to drive their digital transformations one classroom at a time. And now for your host, with over two decades of experience working with tech coaches and ed tech companies from all around the world, Jeff Bradbury. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Teacher Cast Educational Network. My name is Jeff Bradbury, and thank you so much for joining us today and making Teacher Cast your home for professional development. This is Ask the Tech Coach podcast, episode number 158. And today we are celebrating all things Google Apps for Education with our good friends over at GEG New England. That is right, this is our monthly September. Roundtable, big meeting. We're talking all about formative assessment today. And with me, as always, is my co-host, Miss Susan Vincent. Sue, how are you today? Welcome to Ask the Tech Coach. Hey, everybody. It's good to be here for the live show on YouTube and here for the audio podcast. And I'm excited tonight to get to talk Google. That is right. We are here broadcasting live on YouTube. We're here on Facebook. We're here on Periscope. If you guys are out there, do us a favor. Please leave a comment below. We would love to hear that you guys are out there. Let us know where you're from. We would love to get to know you guys. And of course, we are here live every single month with our friends over at GEG New England, where we're going to be bringing them on right now. I want to bring on Christina and Jen and Jen and Eric and Jolie and Edith. Everybody, how are you doing? We're great. Thanks, Jeff. Fun to be here. It is so nice to have everybody on. I'm excited for this show, talking all about formative assessments. Let's do a quick round the room so everybody who's watching live and everybody who's listening in their cars can can know who's talking. I'm going to start over here to my right. Christina DiMaselli, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, I'm Christina. I am the technology integration specialist at Pinkerton Academy in Derry, New Hampshire. So I am your GEG New Hampshire person and all things Google. Hey, Jeff. We're excited to be here, too. I am here from Massachusetts. I work in Woburn Public Schools as the technology director, so it's a crazy busy time of year for us as we get started with kids. But it's just so great to have our students back and be doing what we love. Happy to be here tonight to share some things with our listeners. And from Massachusetts up to the great state of Maine, Mr. Eric Larson. Hey, I'm Eric Larson. I'm the director of technology up here in York, Maine, about an hour north of Boston and ready to have a great show. And from Maine down to Miss Jolie Boucher. Massachusetts. Yes, my name is Jolie Boucher and I work in Plymouth, Massachusetts in a K-5 elementary school. I teach literacy and information technology and I'm also a technology coach. And Edith Fogarty. Hello, I'm Edith Fogarty. I am a tech integrationist at a K-5 to school in Vermont. And let's try one last time to see if we're good. Jen Thomas. Can you hear me this time? Absolutely. Go for okay. it. Sorry. Uh, Jen Thomas, I'm the instructional technology specialist at Dartmouth High School in Massachusetts, but I live in Rhode Island, so I'm representing Rhode Island in this wonderful group of Google educators. Happy to be here. And the great state, the great New England state of Kentucky. Miss Susan Vincent, it is good to see you. It is good to see everybody here today. Sue, how are you doing? I am great. We're plugging along like usual with the school year. And like I said, I'm excited to kind of get back to our Google conversation. It's been a while since we've gotten to just have a Google chat. It has been. We are here talking all about formative assessment. But before we do, you guys out there might be saying, what is a Google educator group? Guys, what is a Google educator group? How can we join? How can we be a part of the Google educator group from New England and Kentucky? Well, Jeff, the Google Educator Group is a free group of educators focused on supporting one another in the use of Google and other applications to support learning. So we are available on a website and uh, they can navigate to gegnewengland.com to find us. And there is information there on how to sign up for our mailing list to be able to tap into the great colleagues that we are lucky to have to ask questions and share ideas with. 
Check that out over at gegnewengland.com. There's a lot of great resources on there. I know recently, guys, I don't know if anybody wants to hit this one, but the, G, the, the, the Google tests have recently updated. There's a lot of new Google features coming out. And today we are going to be wrapping all that Google stuff. But I got to ask you guys, how has the school year been? Um, I'm only three weeks in. I know Sue's a few more weeks in than me. How are you guys doing? What is the latest and greatest? And what are your teachers looking forward to this year? And I'll ask one more. What are the biggest challenges that as coaches that you guys are facing? Christina, what's what's the hot button these days in your schools? So that's a loaded question right there, isn't it? Um, yes. So we're really excited. We, you know, we have kids back on campus. That's fantastic. We love having them here with, there with us because it really makes a difference to have that face-to-face -face instruction. Um, but it's exhausting. It absolutely is. Um, I think we all feel like we're much further into the school year than we really are. It's uh, it's definitely going to be a, a little bit of a slog through this, and we're kind of taking it in chunks. So we'll go six weeks at a time. That's what we're going to plan for right now, and then a little bit later plan for the next six weeks, at least from an instructional coach point of view. Jen, what are you doing these days? What is the latest and greatest up in your buildings? I'm going to guess it's the me gen. I don't know. There's two gens. We're going to have to figure out how to distinguish that, Jeff. <laughs> so um, I'm at a district level, so I serve 10 buildings, and we just started a week ago. We start pretty late, so um, things have been very hectic with teachers just kind of um, getting back to routines with kids, and it's exciting because we definitely have a much greater density of devices, which is really going to open up a lot of opportunities that we didn't have previously, and we're already seeing some differences um, pretty immediately in the teacher's willingness and, and comfort in using technology after that COVID year. So it's exciting to see how we can really take off and, and look at the advantages of leveraging technology in ways that work in our in-person instruction. Looking forward to doing that this year. So you've been in school a little bit longer than many of our New England friends here. Are you noticing that your teachers are settling in? Is there a routine? Um, I know at least in my district, some of the teachers are like, I'm not using Chromebooks until like a while from now. Are you settling in down in Kentucky? We're settling in, but I'm getting so much of this year is even harder than last year. And my school system was face to face all year last year. But for some reason, this year has been even harder because you know, it was that we thought we were going to start the year in more of a normal fashion and it hasn't played out that way. So we've had to backtrack and go back to protocols and other things for safety measures. And it's just like they they're getting frustrated easily because they were so confident that we were going to have a more normal year. So we were more prepared last year, even though we were face to face, we still had to follow the safety guidelines. Now devices and everything, we've had those from the get go. We've already had one to one Chromebooks. We're good to go there. So, you know, we've been using them right off the bat just to prepare for any instance of having to go remote. We just encourage teachers to start teaching those Google classroom procedures and things like that right from the get go. Edith, you're shaking your head. How, how are things settling with you? Or I, I see you agree with what's going on with Susan here. Yeah, we, we've been back in, uh, in pr person for about four weeks. Um, and we are, much like Susan was saying, we were face-to-face uh, -face all last year uh, with, I think, the exception of one week. Um, and we've, we went through the summer with people saying that things were going to be a pretty normal year. And then once the year got here, it, it, that's not really how it's been. Um, but we are one-to-one -one Chromebooks. Uh, second through sixth, our, our kindergarten and first grade teachers pretty much begged me to not have to, to do that route this year. They want to get back to, you know, the, the better instruction of, you know, handwriting and, and uh, you know, and play learning. I mean, that, that a lot of the kindergarten and first grade students uh, need to do for developmental reasons. So they, um, that, We've we've been working really hard with the older grades, especially of the inevitable. We've already had um, three classes at our school have to go remote for a week. So we've done the, you know, intense training. I spent spent my day today doing a lot of intense, you know, how do you email people and how do you 
upload pictures to Google Classroom and how do you do all of these basic things in case you're not here in person. So it's it's been that, you know, intense from day one kind of year already. I, I'm feeling it now in my in my school. I'm doing a lot of the basics as well, trying to not uh, throw tech at them, but throw digital learning at them and using that term in a different way. Eric, you've got a couple of things that we're going to go over today, all about formative assessments. And you're going to bring up today something I've started with in my building, which is what can you do with a Google form? Talk to us a little bit about using Google forms for a simple, basic formative assessment. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, Jeff. So formative assessments, there's so many tools out there you can do that with, but my head goes to Google Forms immediately only because if you get stuck in sort of a routine, um, you can easily kind of copy one form and make it accessible for the next week ahead. So things like easy exit tickets after a class or after a week, what have you learned? Let's reflect on this, check for understanding, things like that. Um, you can create one template and then quickly do file, make a copy on Google Forms and create something with just a slight variation for the next week or the next day ahead, depending on what the lesson is. I also love it when uh, kids get together in collaborative groups or even if they're by themselves and they present something to the class and they use Google Forms as a way to check for understanding with the kids based on their presentation, which is fantastic. Um, it's also great because, as you know, in the responses section of Google Forms, you have a way to kind of uh, see the whole group with the bar graphs just by checking on that. And that gives you a great formative assessment of the teaching. So I get to reflect on how I did, whether I need to back up and reteach something or, hey, we're pretty good. The most, most, the majority of the class gets it. We can move on. Or, you know, as one of my friends used to say, uh, you know, there are great things in forms, but the magic happens in the sheets. You can have all of the data dump into Google Sheets, and then you can take a look at individual understanding and really kind of boil it down to, all right, there's a couple of kids here that uh, need to be retaught on certain things, or I need to double check on things. And again, that's all behind the scenes. So the teacher can kind of see it, tap the kid on the shoulder the next time and uh, take a look at what's going on. And then lastly, using things like YouTube or Moat, you're going to hear more of that from my colleagues, but um, you can add YouTube obviously to Google Forms as sort of a video tutorial, but now Moat allows you, uh, if it's installed for the teacher, to do an audio prompt. And then if you push out Moat to all your students, the students can use that as an audio feedback. So in their forms, instead of having to type, and this works perfectly for our littles or maybe ELL students where they can uh, voice in their prompts versus typing in their answers to any of these forms. Has anybody seen the fact that Google Forms has changed a lot in the last few weeks? Have you guys seen the updates pushed out? I love the updates. It took me a while. If anybody hasn't seen them, let me see if I can pull this up over here. Um, you might notice, zoom in here for those playing the home game, there used to be the little gear over here for settings. And I was looking and looking and looking and it's no longer there. And it turns out that they actually stuck it over here. How do you guys feel about this? I'm curious. Um, you can now click on settings and I, I, I don't think they've added any features. Has anybody noticed that they've added anything? You can still click to make a quiz. You can change your responses, collect emails. I, know I, think, we... I think this is great, Jeff, because I, I think that teachers, um, especially those that wanted to create a quiz off of their form, really struggled with finding where and how to do that. And that settings gear where we previously went kind of had so many other things. It was difficult to find what you were looking for. So putting this as a third tab to the right of the responses tab, um, I do think allows more space for them to spread out all of the different options and make it clear what's kind of available beyond a standard form. So I kind of like that. Anybody else? Yes, I yeah. like it too. And I also noticed that there is a new setting, which is the disable autosave. So autosave rolled out um, well, a few weeks ago and it allows users to autosave their Google form responses in their Google Drive for I believe up to 30 days. So that restriction is there. Um, and I think it, I think it's a more intuitive layout, to be honest. I like it. I think it's going to give me a little bit of time to uh, to check this out. I'm wondering if this would make it easier. I don't know. Has anybody tried using a Google form and making a Google form on their phone? I, I would love to have Google come out with like the Google forms app. Um, 
personally, or at least make it easier to do it on an iPad. Although that's that's a different podcast altogether. But <laughs> for those of you who haven't checked that out, uh, definitely do. There's a lot of new features that I'm seeing that have been rolling out with everything here. But there's a lot more to talk about with Google. Um, Christina, you're going to talk today a little bit about enhanced formative assessment. Share Enhan- a little bit with us. Okay, so this actually segues really well well from um, Eric talking about forms. One of the things that I am always interested in is uh, the workflows that we use and how to kind of tighten those up and take some load off of the teacher, the load off of the student, so that they can really concentrate on what is important. So what I'm going to talk about here is a Google add-on for... Um, Google Forms. It's an add-on for Google Forms, and it's called Doc Appender, and it does exactly what it says. It appends or it adds to a document. It adds on to the end of it. So the setup for this is a little bit, um, you know, when you're going to paint a room and you have to do all the prep work, and that's a real pain in the neck, but the end result is fantastic. It's kind of the same here where the prep work is a little bit of a pain, but once you've got that all set, you're good to go. What happens is you create a document for each person, for each student, for example, and then In the form, what this add-on will do is it will grab the names of all of those. So you put their name, you know, Joey and Sally, and that's the name of each document. It will pull those into a Google form question. So what happens is, so you could use this, for example, as a teacher, is you could have a Google form and one of the questions, uh, you're going to select that kid and you're going to give feedback. There may be a couple of other questions. They're doing something at the front of the room and you want to give your uh, feedback to him. And when you hit submit, it is going to add that to the end of their document and you could give them access to it. You could also use this as kind of an exit ticket or feedback or peer feedback, whatever it is that you wanted to do, where the kids could do this. You give them the link to the form and they do, they select who they're going to be doing it on and give their feedback. They click enter uh, or submit and it's going to go to the end of that form for that person. So you can kind of get this history. You know, if you did this for a full semester and you could track kind of what they're doing in a certain area, that could be really, really interesting. So there's a a video that I did um, on the GEG New England YouTube channel that kind of goes through this and actually walks you through how to set this up. And I'm in the process of putting another video together that will help you if you've got a classroom roster and kind of pulling that in. I've been playing with how to hack this a little bit as usual, but uh, that's the one that I've got. And I like that one a lot. Definitely check out all the links over at gegnewengland.com. Hit that subscribe button on the YouTube channel. You'll be notified of every time that we're doing a live GEG New England show with our friends over at the Ask the Tech Coach podcast here. But that's not it. Jolie, we've got some great things about Google Slides happening. Talk to us a little bit about Google Slides and formative assessment. Well, Google Slides is one of my favorite apps in the G Suite, and I use it for almost everything. I just love it. And one of the uses is to create a formative assessment slide that you can reuse all year. So you can just go into the theme builder. If you go to view theme builder, you can create one slide and you can even now add an image placeholder. So when you go to view theme builder and you start creating, you will now be able to insert a placeholder. That is a new update that rolled out a few weeks ago. If you click on insert, it's at the very bottom. And you can insert a placeholder because students don't need to just type a digital response. They could take photos of their notebooks or their worksheets, and then they can type their um, response or the mode extension. They can insert audio using the mode extension that we all just absolutely love. So um, that is one way students can reply to your formative assessment. And then the next step would be, if you're so inclined, you can create a collaborative deck. And I love slidesmania.com. They have so many amazing pre-made decks. On my slide, I um, shared an example of a theme um, that you could use for exit tickets. And what I have students do is I have them insert 
their import slide. So once they're done with their slide, they go to the collaborative slide deck that I either created or got from Slides Mania, and they go to File Import Slide and they import their slide into the collaborative deck. Now, you don't have to do this, um, but I, I find that students enjoy looking at other students' responses once they have replied. It's great for scaffolding and peer modeling, and then that mode extension is just a great addition to add that audio. So as a teacher, I would use the mode extension maybe to clarify or elaborate my directions, and students can use the mode extension to maybe share their thinking about a, a picture that that they added or an image they added or um, just to elaborate more about their response as well. So Moat is just amazing and all you need to do is insert the extension and you will see it will auto populate in your slide deck and it works across the entire G Suite. You do have to click refresh so there's a little trip tip right there. And then you'll see the purple circle with the white M in it. And all the students and teachers do is, is they just click on the um, extension and they seamlessly are able to click start and insert the audio into their slide deck. Um, I think it's a must have extension. I just love it. That's pretty awesome. And I like what you just mentioned that if you click on to view, and you go to Theme Builder. They used to call that Master Slides, as you mentioned. But this, I'm so glad that they put this out there. I used to teach it that it's under the T. And it looks like you can still do that here. But the fact that you can now do it under the Insert menu, that's pretty cool. I haven't seen that update yet. Now, Jolie, you were mentioning something about Moat. We have a very special... Um, what would you call it, Eric? We're, we're going to be doing something at the end of this uh, broadcast. Eric, talk to us a little bit about what we've got coming up here later on in the show. Yeah, so I reached out to Mode a little bit, and my buddy John Neal, who is uh, a fellow Google Teacher Academy UK 2014 member with me, said that he would give away an unlimited year for Moat for anybody who wants to um, kind of enter our little challenge, which is hashtag how you moat. So if you um, send it to us, you know, hashtag uh, GEG New England and show us how you moat, we will pick a winner and moat will give you an unlimited year supply. That is pretty awesome. How many of you guys are currently working with moat, trying moat, have moated before? <laughs> moat all the time. I moat all the time. That is awesome. <laughs> I, you know, so today, um, I was working with my kids and they were hungry and I said, what, what do you want? And they said they would like some jam. And I said, jam, this is a really bad segment, but oh, I heard that there's yes. a lot of great ways to do formative Let's assessment. Let's jam with Google. Come on. There's a lot of great ways to do formative assessment. I understand using Jamboard. Jennifer Thomas, save me from this one. That was, a great, that was a great segue, Jeff. I, I'm, I'm trying for both the visual and the car audience right now. Go ahead. Yeah, that was good. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll, I guess I'm going to start with, I took, I had a moat icon on this slide and then I took it off because I figured everyone else was covering moat. But I should also say that moat works, as Julie said, really seamlessly with Jamboard. So um, thank you. You added it for me. That was so sweet. Okay. There it is, folks. It's on the slide now. Great. Um, so Jamboard is a great tool for, I'm a, I'm a very visual person, so I love Jamboard for, um, I primarily use it actually to conduct teacher professional development, um, brainstorming, um, and you can see the, the little um, access Y and Y and X access grid in the middle. That's a screenshot of a Jamboard that one of my teachers did expressing challenges um, and frustrations that they have during the school day. And we were trying to brainstorm ways to um, come up with technology solutions that might help their day a little bit better. So um, Jamboard works really well for something like that. Um, you know, in the past, I've used something like Padlet or um, even, you know, like Google Keep or something like that. But Jamboard is just nice because you can have multiple frames in one Jamboard. Um, you can, I like to assign each teacher a different frame depending on the group of, of teachers I have in front of me. And then they can kind of do their own thing or they can collaborate together 
um, in on one frame, which is nice. For students, as as all my colleagues have mentioned before me, it works great as a warm up for students. You know, how are you feeling today? Like a temperature check of your class, um, a check, a quick check for understanding. They could embed a little sticky note to tell you how they're feeling. Um, a quick exit ticket the same way. So I won't go all through examples of all of those things because I've linked a ton of resources in the templates, more templates, and even more templates sections. Um, I will give a shout out to Julie for sharing the end even more templates weeklet with me, which is a curation of um, lots of elementary uh, aged templates that you can use with students for Jamboard. Um, and then the tips and ideas in the bottom in the yellow is a um, a post from Matt Miller, who puts together lots of different ideas about Jamboard. Um, and then finally, the YouTube icon in the upper right hand corner links to my playlist of videos that are all tutorials on Jamboard. So if you want to get lost in the Jamboard um, hole, you can feel free with this slide. <laughs> And we're going to make sure we have all the links over here on Ask the Tech Coach podcast, episode number 158. Sue, you know, there's a lot of great things going on here with Jamboard. Do you get a chance to Jamboard often, Sue? I try. I'm trying to get my teachers to um, get acclimated to it and use it. We've actually used it as a curriculum team. We use it to plan our PD sessions. Um, we got actually a couple of PDs, P PD, PD days coming up at the end of September and beginning of October. So we've used um, Jamboard to plan those. The post-it note feature is just awesome. And the color coding, you know how I love color coding. Mm -hmm. so, so yes, we've used it within our team and I'm working on modeling it for teachers as we send things out to them, respond this way, much like Jen just said with, you know, exit tickets and training sessions and trying to talk it up that way. You know, there's so many great things happening in our classrooms as we get started with the school year. We want to hear what you guys are doing. Don't forget, you can reach out over at gegnewengland.com. And, of course, you can find our show over at Ask the Tech Coach on Twitter and askthetechcoach.com. We started this journey talking about formative assessments using Google Forms. But so many teachers forget that you can create a simple formative assessment using, that's right, Google Forms classroom either talk to us a little bit about how important google classroom is and some of these little hidden features to the great application that we all know and love yeah i, th I think a lot of the teachers that i work with use google classroom as a way to just post assignments for students to complete and really in that classwork tab there are several tools that will help you with just really quick simple formative assessments uh, the first one is you can create a quiz directly in your classwork tab i mean it's a it's a form that's just you know, nicely packaged in the in that classwork, um, you know, to add in a, a classwork quiz. But, um, you know, it has all the, the all the tools and everything that a form would have, like Eric talked about. Um, but one of the easiest things that you can do just for a quick warm up or a quick exit ticket is to create a question. And those questions can be short answer or they can be multiple choice. Um, you can grade them. You can not grade them. You can have a due date. You can not have a due date. You can. It's treated just like every other classwork assignment. And so, you know, you can prepare it ahead of time and have it pushed out at the end of your class period so that it pops into their stream and they can just answer it really quickly before the, you know, the end of the class. Um, that gives you just a, just like every other classwork assignment, it will show you um, your, your grid panel of all of the students' answers and responses so that you can, you know, just get a quick sense of where your class sits and you can pivot if needed. Um, once again, Moat, I will give a huge plug if you think about, you know, short answers that students need to respond to, if they can give that audio response um, instead of having to type. Uh, our school is um, had our first professional development of the year on universal design for learning. Um, and this is a perfect tool that, that, you know, put it in place and you can't miss because it meets everybody's needs, whether or not, you know, they need it. Um, the other, the other plug that I'll give to Google classroom is just the ability to go into a document and give comment feedbacks on their, their document or on their slide deck so that students get that immediate, you know, I noticed you've got three words that are misspelled in this, this paragraph. Can you find them and fix them? And then if students resolve those comments, then you have a, a, a way to assess, like, did they find the right three words? 
for example. Um, so I've, I've added there just some directions on how to quickly create a question. Um, and uh, I hope you just give it a try just to test it out and see how it works for you. Lots of great stuff, but we are not done yet with this journey through formative assessment. Jen, you've got a couple things coming up about accessibility. Um, I like this topic. I, I think this needs to be one of those things that we kind of feature and focus more on in the edu world here. But talk to us a little bit about what we can do here using uh, formative assessment tools and accessibility. Thanks, Jeff. I think it's something that, um, you know, coming into a district with a more diverse student population, I've been more tuned into, I think, than I have historically, just because we serve a population of students. And, and I, you know, not only are these ideas something that are helpful for English learners, but um, I'm going to also share an idea for early readers and writers. So one of the things that I think is very helpful is the idea of providing the option of voice typing. And we talked about moat, but I think too, um, voice typing can be very satisfying for kids who have great ideas, but their typing skills, or maybe even their reading and writing skills are not developed enough yet for their ideas to be able to be shared with the teacher. And so the ability to go to the tools menu in Google Docs and choose voice typing allows students to be able to speak their response and you can use this kind of feature with very early learners by using, for example, an image prompt. Um, I always recommend teachers use real photos as opposed to clip art because there's a lot of brain research that tells us that kids will be able to relate better to photos, um, even if you can use photos of peers or themselves. Um, but, you know, using a photo to maybe have them tell you a story about the picture and look at their uh, writing but in you know provided to you through voice typing can be a way for them to create a really robust response without the limitation of typing i think a lot of us have seen that even with kids that can type they they tend to provide a smaller response when it feels like a big task to type out their response as opposed to to um, speak their response John, I have a question about this. Has, yep. Obviously, we know in a Google Doc, you can have multiple people working at the same time. Does anybody have an experience with multiple voice to typing at the same time or multiple, I'm going to say it, multiple moding at the same time? You, you can definitely do multiple people voice typing in a doc. The, the key is that you have to make sure the cursor is in a place. So I always tell people, if you're having students collaborate in a document or a slide, it's all about making sure everyone has a place and they know their place. Um, so I usually, if I'm having something like that happen, I would create a table. Usually I would insert a table with Google Docs, for example, and I would put a student's name in a box so they know to put their cursor in that box before they do that thing, right? So that way it's clear where they belong because they get so confused when their words are like cut off in the middle because their friends started typing or talking. Um, so I think the critical thing is that everyone needs to know where they go. It's definitely not how I start kids off in Google. I definitely don't recommend teachers start with a live collaboration because it can get a little crazy um, in the classroom where they're like, oh my goodness, what's happening? And why is someone typing in my thing? And so um, it's a little bit more of an advanced feature, not for the first couple weeks of school, for especially for our younger kids. But I've also, go ahead. Go ahead. I've also taught them to go up to the top and look for their circle and match the color and their, their place will also match the color of their circle. That's so I, I try to tell them to follow those color coding. See me with color again. But Google Docs can support multiple people doing voice to text at the same time. Yes. That's cool. Because yep. I could easily see 20 slides. Every kid gets a slide and they're just talking. That's <laughs> that's a really, really cool feature. So I, I also wanted to share, Jeff, um, another thought or another strategy that I've used um, that has been successful, and that is addressing the needs of our English learners, particularly those students new to the country that, that have almost no language. And I think as teachers, we certainly, in our effort to make kids not feel you know, like they can't access the curriculum, we tend to do the wrong thing by making the question oversimplified or really sort of like, uh, you know, 
changing what we're asking as opposed to how we allow them to respond. And so what we need to think about with these students is they have the knowledge, they just don't have the language. So what are the ways that we can facilitate that? And in Google Docs, what I've been um, doing lately is when I create something in Google Docs, if I have multiple languages, what I would do is I will use the Google Translate feature within Docs. So you can take any document and go to the tools menu, choose translate document, and it will allow you to choose a language from a pretty, pretty big list. And it will create a copy of your document and um, in a new file. And that new file, what I typically will do is change the sharing permissions so that it's accessible to anyone with the link and copy the link. And then at the very top of the page where I have the question prompt, I'll put a little prompt that says something like, read this question in Spanish and read this question in Portuguese. And then I'd highlight that text and link the text so that they can go into the other document. It doesn't, it doesn't take that much longer for me to do it. It takes a few extra minutes. And then if I put the assignment in classroom, for example, any student can access it because if they can't access it in English, they can click on one of the links within the document so that they can jump to the question in their native language. And then the truth is they can respond in their language if they wanted to, and I can use the process again with the translate, uh, the Google document that they turn into me if it's not in English to be able to assess their response you know, in my case, uh, you know, this is an example question of a science concept. So um, there's a, the slide has a link to an actual example of this if teachers wanted to see, but um, it's just a great way to, again, make sure we're focused on the content and not thinking about the language as, as meaning the students have limitations about what they know. Meeting the students where they are, creating these great formative assessments, making sure that everyone's on the same page. It's all about helping our students connect to the content that they're learning and doing it in a fun and exciting way. Speaking of fun and exciting, we have a great contest that we're running right now. And to tell us all about it is the amazing Eric. Eric, talk to us a little bit about uh, this thing that we're doing with Moat. Yes. Yeah, so for the next month, um, let's see how you moat. If you use the hashtag how you moat on Twitter, uh, get New England members as well as people from moat will be taking a look at how you moat and we will be picking a winner and moat will be giving away a free one year unlimited subscription to moat, which is fantastic. Even if you multiple moat as Jeff brought up. I'm not going to touch that one. <laughs> I wouldn't either, Jeff. <laughs> this is a family show, and many people are hopefully still listening to this while driving to work. You guys, we have a lot of great things happening here on Google Education Group New England. And, of course, we're not the only one. There's a lot of other GEGs. Don't forget to check out stuff happening next week. Jennifer Judkins, tell us a little bit about what's happening next week, next, next month. Oh, my gosh. I love talking about Chrome extensions. I feel like they are superpowers for your web browser. And I think that teachers easily get overwhelmed by how many there are. So, you know, our team's just gonna curate these for you and let you know what are the, you know, what are the real top hits that you need to be tuned into um, so that you can be more productive and do more things in your web browser, which is frankly how most of us are doing all of our work. So looking forward to sharing that next month. You guys got to check this out. It's going to be a real quick show. We're only going to be talking about Moat the entire time, just the Moat Chrome extension. Eric, what do we need to do next week when we're looking at that Moat Chrome extension? One more time. Yeah, just make sure that you share out how you moat with the hashtag how you moat and make sure you tag both at just moat HQ and also at Geg New England. And that way, uh, reviewers can take a look at how you moat and there'll be a winner chosen. Jolie, talk to us a little bit about the great resources we have on our website. Absolutely. If you visit gegnewengland.com, you will see our resource library. We have curated lots of videos, blog posts, and templates for you. So make sure you check it out and join our Google group for the latest and greatest news and resources. And we're also doing something great with Moat. Eric, tell us a little bit about it. <laughs> 
Yeah, in case you haven't heard, we're doing a little contest. <laughs> it's still called How You Moat. So use the hashtag How You Moat on social. Make sure you tag at Just Moat HQ. So my buddy John Neal and a couple others over there can take a look at it, as well as Gag in New England. So my colleagues here can take a look at it. And we will decide who the winner is for a free one year unlimited subscription to Moat. And don't forget, guys, you can check out all the great stuff. All of our archives from Ask the Tech Coach are over on AskTheTechCoachPodcast.com. This is episode number 158. Let's do a quick uh, round robin here. Where can we find out the great things that you're doing in this in this world? Edith, how can we get a hold of you? Um, I am on Twitter sometimes. I'm really bad at Twitter. But I'm E, to e underscore Fogarty um, at, on Twitter. Jolie. Yes, I'm on Twitter at Jolie Boucher and at flippedtechcoaching.com. Jen Thomas. I am on Twitter at Blended Lib Girl. Jennifer Judkins. I'm on Twitter at Teaching Forward and teachingforward.net. Christina. You can always find me on Twitter at Mrs. D, M R S D I. Eric. Hashtag how you mo- No, oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm on Twitter as well at E Lawson1977. Guys, it's been a great show. Thanks so much for coming on today. Sue, you know, there's a lot of great things that are happening in the world of instructional coaching. Our Tech Coaches Network is doing so splendidly. Now yes. we're almost over 300 tech, tech coaches. And my goodness, there are a lot of coaches out there that are reaching out for support and help. Head on over to askthetechcoach.com today to check out our TeacherCast Tech Coaches Network. It is free. It is a professional learning community that is second to none. Check out all the great stuff. But, Sue, you've got some other great things happening. What are you doing every day or every week on Tuesday over on your YouTube channel? Look for my Tech Tip Tuesdays on my YouTube channel. Just search my name, Susan Vincents or Tech Imaginations, and you will find me over there. Very, very nice. Eric, before we go, there is a question from a John O'Neill. Is there a moat contest? Hmm, I'm going to have to look out for that. But oh, yes, there is. Hashtag how you moat. Don't forget to tag at just moat HQ and at GEG New England so we can vote on who's the best. And you get a one year unlimited subscription to moat. And that wraps up this episode of Ask the Tech Coach. On behalf of everybody here on GEGNewEngland.com, Ask the Tech Coach, Sue Vince, and everybody here in the TeacherCast Educational Network, my name is Jeff Bradbury, reminding us to keep up the great work in your classrooms and continue sharing your passions with your students. You've been listening to Ask the Tech Coach, hosted by Jeff Bradbury of the TeacherCast Educational Network. Please reach out to the show with all of your questions on Twitter at Ask the Tech Coach or online at www.askthetechcoach.com. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss any future episodes. And please take a moment to write a review in the App Store.